Well, I guess I'll begin. Hi, my name is Malavika. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a part of Fruit of Our Youth. Um, hi, my name is Dia. I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm a member of the Root of Our Youth. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Molly. I use any pronouns, and I am also part of the Root of Our Youth. Hello, my name is Angelina. I go by Andy and she, her pronouns, and I'm also part of Root of Our Youth. Uh oh, Malavika, she froze. She's got the intro. <laughs> oh, me. All right. I yes, guess, I guess we're really ready to dive in, huh? Sorry, I was a little confused. <laughs> well, it's nice to see everyone here. Before we dive in, I do want to acknowledge all of those that are not here today. The Root of Our Youth is a huge, big organization. Well, not big, but um, we have many people that worked on this, and um, those of us, unfortunately, could not be here today. I also want to acknowledge those that aren't at the table. Um, many of us at the root of our youth are very privileged and, you know, we have the privilege of being here today while many others do not. Um, so I want to acknowledge that there's a lot of people missing here. Um, yeah, and I guess I want to dive into our first recommendation um, as a root of our youth, which would be stopping um, the harm we cause through our education system to marginalized groups. Um, so different races, ethnic groups, genders, sexuality, all of that. Um, I think we must first acknowledge that our education system is based on systemic racism and sexism. And that is what makes up the foundation of many other um, American systems. And that before we attack these issues, we must stop doing harm um, and recognize the harm we've done and amend the harm we've done. So examples could be the lack of ethnic studies, um, how Eurocentric our uh, curriculum is, the culture of racism and sexism aimed at students um, and any other, you know, like lack of diversity and lack of acceptance towards students of different identities. Um, and most of all, now, you know, that we have these issues coming to light, uh, there's no commitment to acknowledging those issues and recognizing those issues and solving those issues. There's a lot of virtue signaling going on that we at Root of Our Youth have seen. Um, and what we ask you is to, again, stop doing harm, amend harm, and commit to um, solutions. And I'll pass it on to Dia. Yeah, I mean, on that same vein, you know, a lot of the practices that we currently have in our school system have been the same way for a very, very long time and have basically perpetuated these same systems that were there a long, long time ago that, you know, we claim to have changed and left far, far behind. But really, how far can you leave those systems behind if you still teach students the same way? Um, but yeah, with that, I think we can move into our next topic. All right, so our next topic is um, following the creation and implementation of the comprehensive and holistic long-term um, decolonization and recommitment to intersectional anti-racist public education plan. Um, we need policies and practices implemented throughout our school system, throughout all systems really, um, that are inclusive of different graduation requirements, um, recruitment, hiring, retention, promotion, demotion of staff, faculty and administration, especially concerning the fact that um, in Washington generally, we don't have, you know, while we are more diverse than other places, um, a lot of our students from diverse backgrounds find that we lack representation and we lack people to look 
up to and people to follow. And we need more diverse spaces, more diverse people, you know, in places of power. Um, we also need policies and practices inclusive of uh, testing and how testing may not work for everyone. Uh, standardized testing has been a controversial topic for many a year now, and I think that we can all agree that it doesn't benefit everyone, and especially when we're talking about AP tests, um, SATs, ACTs, they all require money and effort and privilege that not many have, and the fact that we use them as a basis for um, college applications and other sorts of areas is revealing in that you know, we still base ourselves on a very um, privileged based structure. Um, the Root of Our Youth also had many discussions talking about project based learning and, and instead of essay versus exam based learning, as Dia said, the education system as we have it right now is based on something that we made during the industrial right era. You know, the school system as it is right now is meant to churn out obedient um, students that listen to higher ups and you know do their work and that's it but the world is changing and the workforce is looking for people that can think on their own people that are outside of the box and through of our youth we talked about how project-based learning and exploratory learning could really help students find themselves be themselves and prepare for this changing world um, which is evolving rapidly because of technology and other modern advancements. But yeah, that's um, the point. Um, Dia, Molly, any additions? Um, I don't have anything to add. Molly? I just want to touch on how big the graduation pathways were for like how much we talked about them, because really what a lot of people are missing is customization to what they're learning and in that customization they would be able to do certain things like build community like which are other recommendations we had to fix certain things fix community building fix bonding with students with teachers with staff with faculty everything could be aided by every single one of the recommendations and they will all aid each other so yeah Yeah, all right. And with that, I will switch to our next topic, which is about re-envisioning learning in public schools as we currently know it. So a lot of the current schooling model we have makes a lot of sacrifices for the sake of efficiency, etc. And a lot of these sacrifices are based on the way we go about decision making for a lot of public schools. And one thing to really think critically about in that arena is a lot of the decisions that have historically been made concerning public schools and students do not necessarily center the well being of the students. Instead, they center other concerns or viewpoints of adults who have not experienced schooling in a very long time or have not been in that system. So, one of the things I love about this project, what we're doing currently, is we're centering current students. Yay! Um, because that's really important, you know, that's the best way to see how is the system working right now. But also going back to uh, the point that Malavika brought up at the beginning of the meeting is that a lot of the people who are able to be present in a space like this and who've been taught the skills to stand up for themselves in a space like this are the people whose opinions we need the most. So it's not just about, oh, well, like I'm gonna put this offer out here and wait for the students to come to me. Right, we have to actively reach out and look for students who are severely underrepresented, because without that, we are never going to get a full representation of what students need and what students are missing. And that is really, really important. And we also touched on the point earlier of mastery based learning and standardized testing. Right. So a lot of the way learning works right now is a lot of focus on testing and on meeting certain performance standards that honestly are pretty arbitrary standards. Like, are they that useful? I don't know, debatable, but I suppose you all come up with that. So maybe I shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, nonetheless, right? We want students to retain the information that everyone's putting in so much effort to teach them. 
right? But if you t like try to make students absorb so much information, what you're gonna get is students only remembering bits and pieces, you know? One um, kind of funny analogy we've used a lot in our meetings is dumping a bucket of water onto a sponge. It's just information overload, you know? It's so much at one time that nothing is actually substantially being gained compared to the amount of resources that are being thrown at the sponge. Um, kind of an extended metaphor, but you get my point. Essentially, we want students to learn things deeply. We want students to master what they are learning. It's far more useful for students to learn a small skill set that they can apply to a wide variety of tasks than to have a bunch of random information thrown at them that they cannot use waste of time, energy, resources, and is very, very emotionally taxing on students. You know, that's where we get a lot of the frustration, a lot of the, hey, like I'm not understanding any of this, therefore I must be stupid and can't succeed in this system. It's not the student's fault, it's just we've adopted the approach that is chuck everything at them and see what sticks. Um, yeah. And beyond that, I mean, Molly already touched on exploration. Exploration is really important. And that also kind of ties into the mastery based learning thing where students are more inclined to master things when they feel that it applies to them, right? So allowing students to be more hands on and customize their education more allows students to actually absorb the information that they're taking in more and makes that information more pertinent to them. Uh, Malvika, you have something to add? Yes, um, so to provide examples of what we've been talking about, you know, concerning exploratory learning, uh, we've talked about editing graduation requirements so that high school doesn't feel like a very stringent little box of just, you know, you have this many courses to take and you must finish them all. Um, a lot of students that I've talked to and me personally feel like most of my high school experience has just been doing what the requirements say I have to do. Um, and I've really only chosen one or two classes for myself. And those two classes have been the classes where I've learned the most. And so giving students more choice um, concerning graduation requirements. We've also talked about classes uh, where students are guided by teachers, but choose their own curriculum, choose you know, their own research. Um, there have been classes like this before where students conduct their own research and they have been very successful. Um, we've also talked about the idea of universal design and making education something for everyone because it really isn't right now. So that would mean including supports for those with mental health issues, um, making sure that uh, students in special education curriculums are able to interact with others um, and along the lines of being more inclusive in general. But yeah, that's my point. I'd like to add to, to the second recommendation before we move on that a really big component of this like reimagining of very long term education that lasts is also that we want to make sure that with students being in charge of their own learning, they're able to learn how to teach themselves things in the future. Because the way that public school currently functions, we do not teach students how they can educate themselves. And I don't mean necessarily politically. I mean, even if one day I decided I wanted to learn about marine biology, I would have no idea where to dig in because I have not been taught in school where to start and how to perform research. I have only been taught how to fit into the research that teachers have done. And because of this, a lot of students end up only having a surface level understanding of every single topic they learn in school, which if you are already privileged and ignorant, causes far more issues that could be avoided with earlier education. Um, and I just remembered some other points that are go along with this third recommendation, um, along with discussing editing graduation requirements, exploratory learning, we've also talked about how a lot of the school culture feels very individualistic and our um, experiences, Root of Our Youth has participated in many intergenerational teachings and you know, mutual learning and learning as a group and exchanging information. Um, so 
you know, we've we've talked about having education be more of a group effort, um, making sure that students have voices, students are centered, social emotional learning is centered. Uh, we also, I do want to include a point about how a lot of students don't master what they're learning and don't feel prepared for the future. So, you know, when editing graduation requirements, thinking about courses or really just information that students need to succeed in the future, how to do your taxes, how to pay for college, how to do things on your own and function as an adult. Because I can say with much confidence that not many of us feel ready to do that. And being asked to make life decisions at age 16, 17, 18 is really scary when you're not giving students the appropriate resources that they need. So. Um, all right, Angie, anything to say? So another point that I would really love to touch on, uh, specifically with what Dia said, there's so much concentration on having to focus on learning things in standardized tests. So I think we missed out on an opportunity of social and emotional learning, right? Because we're given an opportunity to be surrounded by new people and people our age who may have similar interests. And yet, because we're putting that concentration on having to memorize things that we probably won't remember after exam season, we're not able to gain those characteristics of empathy. And honestly, empathy can do a lot in a lot of situations because I know so many students who aren't able to know how to socially react in a situation that might be um, racially provocative, and they don't know how to react to other students who may say racist things or how to deal with mental health. And I just think we should be putting more focus also on being able to build that personal characterization and being able to practice those skills in an environment that's supposed to help students thrive and learn how to be people in the real world. Are we moving on to recommendation three then? I think we are on four. Yes, I believe gotcha. we're moving on to number four. Um, so our fourth topic is about fostering connection and affirming collectivism and connection between students and the school community in general. So a lot of like, okay. A lot of schools based off of like very rigid restrictions, right? Lots of check boxes, lots of like, we need to do X, Y, Z, lots of like very, very set systems, which nothing wrong with having a procedure. But again, we're trying to allow flexibility because flexibility allows for growth. And one thing I feel like we forget a lot of times, especially with like the design of the education system as a whole, is that students inherently like to learn and will seek out learning when they feel that they're being nurtured by it and when they feel they have something to gain by it. And a lot of what's detrimental to that is, you know, being too stationary with not allowing students to explore certain interests, not allowing flexibility within subjects, um, et cetera. And I know a lot of that is easier said than done, but again, it is something to consider nonetheless. And you know, one of the things that really brought this to my attention is being in the space that Root of Our Youth has created um, within our own organization. Because yes, I am someone who generally speaking, like, you know, the school environment kind of caters to me and I kind of like it a lot, of, like a lot of the time. Well, not like is a strong word for it, but you know, it enables me to play to my strengths, I suppose. That's a more accurate description. Um, but, you know, a lot of the things we do in our root of our youth space are difficult. They require, you know, a lot of concentration, a lot of hard work. We 
learn very difficult and complicated subjects, you know, more than learning, it's collective learning. We learn from the adults, the adults learn from us. Um, collective learning is something Vincent likes to talk about a lot, which, you know, it's kind of the first time I've ever been introduced to the idea of collective learning in a space is in the root of our youth space. And I think that's really a shame because I think everyone can benefit from a collective learning mechanism. As humans, we all have so much expertise and we can all learn so much from each other. Like, you know, I'm not a professional in any way, shape or form, but I know plenty about the topic of education because I'm currently in the education system and that is why I'm speaking to y'all. Again, perfect example. It's what we're doing right now and we need to make sure we have space for that within our set rigid school environments, whatever you want to call them, within our brick and mortar classrooms, you know? Do they use mortar anymore? I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> that's an aside, but nonetheless. Um, another thing we talk about a lot in our space is representation. So one of the things I love about our root of our youth space, going back to that again, is just the sheer representation we have among the adults in our space, you know, almost like largely adults of color. And I've never in my life been in a space like that before seeing so many successful adults of color. You should have seen my jaw drop when I walked into the space and I like, I was just off in my little Google search tab, looking up all the adults, looking them up on LinkedIn, being like, oh my goodness, all these people are so cool. What? Anyway, but it's just so inspiring just as a person being able to see all of that in front of you knowing, hey, I now have these people as mentors, I can connect to these people more. And that can help me in my future. And, you know, that's why diversity and representation is so, so important because you want students to connect to staff. That's the whole damn point. Like literally, you're supposed to be fostering a connection there. And if you know, students don't have things in common with staff, then where's the connection? You know, it's a lot more difficult to for students to feel comfortable, to feel safe, to form connections when they don't feel that their staff and the adults in their lives represent them. That's a big dilemma for a lot of students of color and a lot of LGBT students too, because a lot of the queer staff members that we do have, you know, are not in a position of safety where they can be open about it. That's a big risk for them. So part of that is having safe work environments as well. Learning is relational, yes. Right, and another thing we talk about a lot is, and I've kind of been talking about this so far, is just connection, right? One of the most important things about connection, and I talked about safety earlier, is just getting rid of that horrible power dynamic that makes students uncomfortable because when you're uncomfortable, you cannot learn, right? So if I'm trying to learn from someone who's big and scary, have y'all like been in school and you have that one like terrifying teacher and you just can't focus because you don't want to make them mad at you, you know? Like you just want to make them like you. You just want to like do the good thing and like get the good like grade or whatever. And you're not even focused on learning. You just want a good grade. You just want them to like you because they very obviously don't like you, you know? It's like, yeah, power dynamic holds our potential back because if you're not comfortable, you can't learn. We've known this like time and time again, you want people to be comfortable so that their brains can do the learning, not just focus on how uncomfortable they are. And when you have that horrible power dynamic, it's really, really hard to be comfortable. And part of the way to fix that is having community, having relationships between students and staff. Community is so, so important in any type of learning space whatsoever, formal or informal, really just community. If you ask me, it's the most important thing because that is what, like, what creates the safety. Yes, multi-generational community learning. Okay, and with that, I believe I pass to Molly, unless anyone else has something to add. I would like to actually add on this like current recommendation and just say that there is such a lack of regulation in teachers being taught how to handle their power dynamic with students that there are many teachers, especially white teachers, who actively reinforce this power dynamic over their students and actively foster an unhealthy learning environment that students are forced to sit through. But due to the fact that it is not technically breaking rules, 
nothing is able to be done about the teacher. And yet other staff will sit and watch because they have also not received any learning or any notification of how to handle those power dynamics in the job setting that they are dealing with. And it is wholly on the responsibility of the employer to be letting the employees know how to handle the clientele, which would be the students. So I believe that in this, we really do need to also add not only community-based learning and getting rid of power dynamics, but also like fully learning and understanding what power dynamics are present in our society outside of our North Shore School District, outside of our Washington State schools. Because even then, if you teach about power dynamics in your school, but not outside, you're still creating a deficit. So the fact that there's none at all is incredibly imbalanced and preps students to be under authority in an unhealthy way especially if they are students of color and especially female students of color who will then go on and be forced to reproduce those power dynamics in their future jobs. <clears throat> I'm now going to, oh, sorry, so sorry. Can I, can I add something real quick? Um, on the point of representation, representation doesn't just help students of color um, and other minorities. Representation helps everyone. When you have um, white students um, and you know like the majority as we call it experience and have people teach them from different backgrounds they are opened up to a whole new world of perspectives and experiences that they may not have encountered before and that is so important when you're raising the next generation we want our students we want our future to be accepting and caring because that's you know the end goal. We want a better community for us all. Um, and on the point of mutual learning, again, do you ever think about why extracurriculars are really successful to, sometimes? Sports teams, academic teams, there's a reason. It's because they work together. Um, these extracurriculars at many times don't even have the power dynamics. Um, I personally, I'm on the Science Olympia team at my school, and all of our learning is done with each other. We sit at a huge table and we discuss and we go to nationals a lot. So it says something that you have these extracurriculars where students are really you know, participating, engaged, learning, and they're bringing success and being successful. And you think, huh, I wonder why that is. But you know, something to think about. I yeah, I also just want to add again to this section that as a white student who spent most of my life not being educated about race, even though I considered myself socially liberal or whatever you want to call it because I supported gay marriage, but I did not know anything about the world of race, being in Root of Our Youth has not only given me an environment where I was not surrounded by people like in my local community who actively advise against learning social justice and active advise against learning how to have empathy for these different groups that are actively being oppressed, but it has also taught me so much. Like the amount that I have learned from students of color in this group is to the point where like, it is insane that I have for free been able to attend sessions where I am given space, where I am allowed to learn, where, am I, where I'm given that empathy that I never received in public education, while in just a few months time, I learned far more than I ever learned in public education about my fellow students, whether they are black, brown, or indigenous, or whether they are a black woman with mental illness explaining how that's a different experience than me being a white woman with mental illness. Like there are so many things that come from benefiting students when you allow them to interact. But when you actively teach students to quite literally segregate into cliques, and when you teach students 
when you form a group project and you say pick your partner and everyone looks at who they go with and the popular kids go off and pick one nerd who's going to do all the work for them and then the like if you're lucky enough as a student of color to have a friend in that class who you know isn't going to literally like microaggress you or force work onto you you can go with them when you actively allow for that to happen in your class you are not only allowing power dynamics to be there but you are teaching power dynamics, you are enforcing them. And so to, to not address this, you aren't just reinforcing those power dynamics, you are taking away from white students from learning about race and from coming out of their shell and from learning about their fellow students. And you are actively disrupting human connection because you are disallowing of students to cross different boundaries from just, you know, the jocks sit here and science Olympiad people sit here because it sounds like a joke, but it's what ends up happening at lunch tables. So the fact that a community like Root of Our Youth was necessary for me while that sucked, having it was amazing. And I learned so much. And that's even from a voluntary thing. Like if we even advertise something like Root of Our Youth to people in school more, even that would be such a quick solution that would aid the school districts in this state by a tenfold so it's this this recommendation with community building it is very fast it is it is very simple to put the steps in place and to teach your teachers and give them curriculum to follow that allows them to foster these environments for their students and when you do it you create such a healthy environment where you see growth and maturity from people that you would literally never see in any other environment and you see connections form like I know Fernell definitely has friends who she would never like have if her and them did not both simultaneously decide to not only cross boundaries but to both advocate for being vulnerable in the same space with each other and agreeing to put that aside. So I just want to say how important this one sounds because while oh community building and let's all hold hands I know it can sound frilly but I think this is just as important as all the other recommendations and I want to make sure that that hits home to you guys that this benefits white students. It shouldn't have to, but I know that people in this call, I don't know, I don't know anybody, but I know someone in this call is gonna be wondering how will this benefit me? How will this benefit my students? It will benefit your students. It will benefit your white students. It will benefit your rich, white, wealthy kid who is well off. It doesn't matter, it will benefit them. And I don't know if anyone else wanted to add on to that before I move on to the last recommendation we wanted to talk about today, but Dia, Malvika, Angie, if any of you want to add, this is a perfect time to. You said it all for us, Molly. <laughs> all right, so with that, we're gonna kick off into our last recommendation that we really noticed being a recurring theme in all of our meetings, and that was flexible graduation pathways, which sounds like such a, simple thing i'm sure this has been suggested to the state board like a billion times but honestly like in combination with these other recommendations it really does aid every single issue because even if it was just a choice within a flexible graduation pathway to take ethnic studies or to take financial advising with a more flexible pathway it opens the door for all of these other recommendations to be reached easier. And it also allows, because students are able to actively choose the pathways they're going into, it allows for easier community building because they already have something where they're in a class for the same reason everyone else chose to choose that class and is attending it, not because it was required and everyone's tired and it's 7 a.m. and everyone hates math and they're trying to learn algebra two without having any breakfast and they're chugging two Red Bulls. Like when you're not in that environment and you're able to choose the classes that um, really speak to you and really drive that passion home for you, you are able to fully succeed in school and it improves your like experience in all your other classes as well even the ones you don't want to take when you are given that flexibility and what we want to do with this flexibility is because it's kind of like a vague word but what we mean really is that we want our graduation pathways to be student based Another way you could think of this, I guess, would be like, oh, like, let's say every student had an individualized education plan. I mean, it's not 
it's not as complex as that would be because IEPs have to do a lot with mental illness and students and accommodations and all of that, but it is similar in that the driving focus is putting students first and letting them choose the pathway they want to take in a school. And that could even be that there are just more pathways and they are given a choice, but like anything other than what we have now, because there are students in Root of Our Youth who have over and over expressed that they either have work outside of school that they did not know they could get credit for because it was so not spoken about by teachers, by staff, by faculty for the entire for the entire length of high school. Um, there's programs that exist that they didn't have time for because they were forced to follow a rigid and old school model, to be frank, where they needed to take full AP. Well, okay, well, I'm taking full AP. What electives can I take? Oh, okay, cool. I'll take like AP like whatever some like very like STEM class where because they were so focused on getting a degree they knew they needed to get into the schools they wanted they weren't even given an opportunity to address interests that could turn into potential careers you know and I think of how there's a whole like auto shop class and how nobody in my district knows that, but everyone in the district has the ability to attend it in high school. Or I think about how I went to DigiPen for my last year of high school, and I was told by my counselor for four years that I could only attend it in the last two years. I go to DigiPen, they tell me I could have done it any of the four years. So even within our current flexible pathways that we've given, there's such a lack of communication that students have no idea how to approach them. And when you combine that with students who may not have the access to these resources, whether it be because of money or because they don't have time, they don't have time outside of school, literally a million issues that there could be, like where not all students are coming with the same amount of access to resources needed to learn in certain programs, it becomes so, so unfair in who has access to what programs that are already available. So kind of a like list of different um, graduation pathways that we wanted to have so that students could feel prepared for their next step we had was basically like, this is a list of all the different things we could think of that were very popular after high school choices that students are not given the ability to learn how to approach after high school and after they get their diploma, after graduation ends. So we have college, work, taking gap years, taking care of your own family, political activism, um, two-year degrees, community college, trade schools, internships, traveling, going into any part of the military, how to run a business if you wanted to start that, or even how to go into professional sports. So even the people that school benefits the most being like a, a white wealthy jock, I would say, even they could not know what they're doing after high school because there's just such a lack of access to the knowledge of career pathways outside of being a lawyer, being a doctor, being a teacher, um, learning math, those are the careers that teachers seem to be able to think of. And it's not embedded in our classes in the first place. Like when you start a class, your teacher should be letting you know what jobs you can get by the end of this course. That needs to be a thing. Like at the end of AP Psych, what can I do? What could this, what could this get me? Can I be like an assistant at a preschool? Could I be starting to become like a community member at a local social justice org? Like there are so many things that we could be learning even within our class that because teachers aren't forced to do, they don't do. And most wouldn't even think to if they were given the ability to because they just don't know because it's not communicated. Um, if anyone else wanted to note on this. Good time. Yes, I would. I have something I'd like to add. Um, well, I love you, Molly. That was great. Okay. Um, that aside, Career connected learning, yes, that is very important. Another thing we wanna talk about and is a really big access problem is time. 
right? So a lot of students have a lot of responsibilities outside of school beyond just school. I feel like lots of educators forget that. They're like, oh, you know, these are kids, you know, what do they have to do? They don't have to work. All they do is school. That's not true at all. So many kids work. So many kids have family responsibilities. And I mean, do we forget about just the fact that students can, you know, it can impact their mental health, like being ridiculously busy? It's not good for child development. I bet a lot of you in this room have studied that. You know, like I bet you've been told that loads and loads of time. You know, children need space to explore. Well, you know, that gets turned off the second you go into high school. All of a sudden they decide, you know, well, they're grown up and they don't need space for anything except school. So yeah, that's my little rant. But beyond that, a lot of these exploration things require time outside of the normal school day, which is an access issue in and of itself, because a lot of students have other responsibilities and not a lot of students are in a position where their families can provide the resources, including childcare, for them to be able to do after school programs in the first place. Right. Like even for me, as someone whose family is like well off, like there's so many extracurriculars and classes that I didn't do simply because my parents needed me to be at home and watch my younger brother or my parents couldn't drive me. You know, that's an issue for a lot of people. And yeah, those are like really like small potatoes issues. But think of all of the bigger issues along those same same lines. You know, a lot of this exploration we're allowing students to do, not helping them do, we're allowing them to do these, right, is they require a lot of effort on the student's part. They require a lot of time and energy and money that the student might not have to dispose of, you know? So yeah, point on that accessibility is really, really important. We wanna make sure we build things into the school day, we build things into our school fees, our budgets, whatever there is that needs to be done, buses, accommodations, et cetera. All of those things are really, really important for ensuring equitable learning because it's one thing to have programs and it's another thing to make those programs accessible. And that's what matters. Um, and that accessibility point connects to universal design. When you implement universal design into everyday structures and systems, it benefits everyone. And really, as we're talking about accessibility, I think it's also really important to bring up how the lack of mental health resources and making those resources accessible definitely hinders the learning process for a lot of students. Because I know when students are struggling and being overwhelmed with the learning process, they aren't even able to get the help that they need and quick help from someone who knows them. Because to be real, most students are struggling during breaks, weekends, summers. And those are during times where they don't have a specific adult from school where they can just talk to. And by providing even outsourced resources or even more convenient resources, I think that would be really helpful in making sure that especially the underprivileged communities are able to access those availabilities and make sure that they're getting the resources that they need to feel the passions and thrive in the school setting. I think Angie made an amazing point right there about, you know, mental health resources are also an accessibility thing and are so, so beneficial to students. I know personally that for me, therapy and all of those things would not have been accessible if I weren't lucky enough for my school to have mental health counselors on staff, right? And it's also really important to have more than one. I feel like I should specify, like when a school has like almost 2000 kids. You can't just have one mental health counselor for them all. I know budget things are a whole mess, but still, it's very, very important to have counselors, to make them accessible and to make them available for all students. Yeah, because counseling outside of school is really expensive and really unachievable. And can I say again, ridiculously expensive. 
Again, accessibility. We want all of our students to be healthy and able to function. Yes, and with that, I think we've been doing a lot of talking. So let's take a minute to digest all of that. And then um, we can come back with questions. Actually, it's about 4.50 right now. Do we wanna take two minutes breather and then come back with questions? Does that sound good? That sounds like a great idea because you've given us so much to think about, so well presented. And um, I at least wanna reflect on the things that you've said and have taken some notes. Um, and then maybe we'll open up to board questions if that works for you. All right, so then we will be back at five, or wait, no, 4.52. There you go, <laughs> I can count, I promise. Um, Does right. that work for you, panelists? Works fine. Just stay there. Let them think. They'll they'll be with you. Yeah. <laughs> stay there. Nobody go anywhere. Yeah. Class is not out. <laughs> They're just giving you a breather. <laughs> Ready for some board comments, questions? Yeah, um, before we dive in real quick, I think we forgot to do this at the beginning, but we wanna thank you guys for holding this space for us. It's not often that um, students get to speak. Um, so yeah, we wanna thank you for providing us the space. We wanna thank you for giving us all these wonderful ideas. Um, any board member wanna, Dive in. MJ, go ahead. You know, I, I, I'm always ready to engage with our students. Thank you so much. Dia, Molly, Angie, Malavika. Did I get y'all? Dia, yep, I got you. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. for, for this presentation, I really, really, uh, I know we all appreciate it so much and value it tremendously. You said so much in there. I was writing frantically, but I think I'm gonna have to go back over the recording to make sure I get it all. Um, one thing that, that really kind of hit me, I, so much of it did, but Dia, when you're talking about students feel frustrated and stupid because there's so much content and they, they you can't, you know, um, get to this, you know, you can't do it all. You can't, I mean, I don't no, no, we can't, none of us could that. I just, I feel that is such an important thing. I, I think my own students, my own kids have felt that. Um, and I think our students are suffering so much. And I, unfortunately, you know, through our system, through our education system, and I think you helped portray that today. Unfortunately, you know, too many, um, so many students with mental health challenges and our system kind of perpetuates that is what I am hearing you say. And it is real and I hear you 
and please just keep helping us understand what it, how I know we have to change in a huge way, but please just keep helping us try to figure this out. I was uh, too many suicides, too many students dropping out, too many students that have given up. Um, this is real. This is serious. And I think you are giving us a good start in what we need to change. So most of all, thank you. Thank yes. you for recognizing that, you know, that's what we want to hear and change is what we want to see. Sorry, Peter, go ahead. No, we're, we're embracing that change. Um, see, Paul and then Patty. Yeah, I, I echo that uh, for providing this, providing us such rich um, conversation and uh, giving us a lot to think about. I do have a question that I heard um, project based education. I heard somebody mention, um, and I also heard mastery based learning. And so, my question is um, how are those opportunities? Are, are there more opportunities for mastery based, project based learning, or is there just enough at all? Um, I just want a sense of what opportunities are at this current time. That's something we're interested in is mastery based learning. Um, I can jump in real quick. As of now, a lot of us find that most of our mastery based learning and project based learning happens at extracurriculars or sometimes science classes where you do experiments or, you know, English or history classes when we have discussions that would, that's what like we're, you know, talking about when we get at mastery based and, you know, like being there application based learning. Um, and I think that, you know, there aren't nearly enough opportunities for students to reflect on their learning and say, like, how can I apply this math formula to my daily life? Because <laughs> many of us share the sentiment that what we're learning is wasting our time. And the fact is, these recommendations or these requirements that, you know, we have as grad requirements right now, they've all been thought out by the adults, but the adults haven't thought about how students need um, to believe that they need this, right? Uh, so I think there are definitely more space, there's space to put in application-based learning uh, in different classes. So that could be, you know, again, just more experiments, more questions and more answering those questions led by students themselves, more, you know, looking at a piece of literature and saying, hey, what ideas from this have applied to my own life, have applied to the daily current events that we experience right now. What, you know, concepts that I've learned in math, how can I, you know, implement that into something else I'm doing? So, and that would connect with, you know, mutual learning as well. If you have students doing application-based learning, there's more, more opportunity for students to learn from each other. You know, think of science fairs. You have all these students showing their learning, discussing their learning, explaining it, and there's opportunities for students to go around and learn from other students, right? So if we could have more science fair type things and generally just kind of, ex you know, like acknowledging and embracing the fact that every piece of learning we do has meaning, right? So we don't like toss away one class or the other. So, yeah. Thank you. I want to, oh, sorry. I was just going to mention that it, it's there. There's just not enough. There's just not enough of that, that really engaged learning. Yeah. And I also think beyond that, like, we're not just saying like, add on these engaging opportunities to like, whatever already exists, you know, like, you have to like, we have to change it to be the, for that to be the core of it, because you know, just tacking it on to the end isn't going to get rid of the detrimental effects of testing because testing is a big, big confidence destroyer for a lot of students and destroying a student's confidence destroys their learning. You know, I've been in a situ situations many times where like, I know the thing, I just am, you know, I get anxious during a test and then you get that bad grade and you feel like you're worthless and then, you know, what are you learning? You're just upset. Like, a lot of what we do, I think, also when we're testing, 
which is kind of ridiculous, is that once we do the test, we don't go over what we missed to like fill in the gaps. Like, what is the point of a test if it's not to identify what you missed and then learn what you missed, you know, rather than just rating, oh, you know, you don't know this thing, so you're bad. Like, that's not useful. It's not useful for anyone, actually. Yeah, right now the core is testing and we want to test, test being like, you know, a loose term with applications, with projects, rather than just, oh, this is like a very, very set rating. You know, like learning has to follow the test. Does that make sense? Yes. And to add on again, project-based learning, you have the opportunity for feedback. When you have a project, a presentation or a discussion, teachers have the ability to include themselves in the conversation and be like, well, here's something that may not be right, but here are ways you can fix it, right? So. Yeah. Thank you. And, and the, te the test shouldn't be the end all. I mean, the, the test, a test is not necessarily learning. Right. And, and projects can also open up the way for more questions. Think of the scientific process. After you finish an experiment, you think, oh, I have another question. And like, this goes to this and that. And it can, I think any subject, not just science, can follow this scientific process of learning. Thank you. Um, let's see. I know that Patty has a comment or question, then Mary Fertakis. Go ahead, Patty. Uh, I'm gonna have to. Apply. I'm really sorry. I have a five o'clock that's waiting for me. I need to leave. I would like to really quickly say thank you to the students. I really appreciated it. I really liked the dialogue. It was great. I was gonna ask you about the role of families and parents in this, but I am so sorry. I have to. Somebody's waiting for me. But thank you very much. I really appreciated it. We can still answer Patty's question in some way. Yeah, let's do that. It on. I guess what I like personally, when thinking of parents, I think of all the parents that haven't had the access in parent-led spaces. I know a lot of you know PTs tend to be like in my parents' experience, very white, and I think having more language supports or making those more accessible, advertising more because a lot of parents do want to get involved and you know some may not have the privilege of getting involved either so we need to provide supports for those that want to get involved and for those who don't have the time the money the energy to get involved so maybe thinking of new ways to reach out newsletters you know or having parent teacher meetings that are you know like hey here's we have parent teacher meetings but i feel like they take on a much more formal, like, da da da, like, your child does this and this and this. And it's, it's not more of like a, hey, like, look at all these things your child is good at and how we can improve. And, oh, like, I think this resource is great for your student and maybe you can communicate better, you know. And that's how I personally think of parent involvement. Great comments. Um... Do you want to say more or can we move on to Mary who has a question? I'm not sure if it's related or not. Mary Fertakis? Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you. And thank you all for um, your time today. It has been invaluable for us. Um, and there are lots of questions I have, but I'm going to ask about one thing that you brought up in your truth telling, and it's the issue of power dynamics. And um, I really appreciate you bringing that up because it really gets to the core of a lot of these issues. And um, I wrote down, teachers are not taught how to manage their power dynamics with students, which reinforces existing marginalizing structures and systems. Um, and especially if we're not able to talk about things like race and social issues, um, popularity, et cetera. Um, and so my question for you is, um, I would love some assistance in, in understanding how, if you have been able to bring up this conversation with uh, adults in the system before, and I'm sure you're watching what's happening on the national uh, scene where we're being asked to literally not have these kinds of conversations with you or not giving you the space to have these kinds of conversations, which are really, really important. 
Um, so um, if you have thoughts about um, how you've been able to do this or um, uh, any, any, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna leave it, leave it at that. Um, how you'd like, anything you'd like to share around that because it's pretty core um, to what's going on with systems. I mean, to be honest, like a whole, you know, a big part of the reason why we're bringing it up is being in a classroom setting makes it pretty darn difficult to do those things. And sorry, family member interrupting. Uh, <laughs> but being in the classroom setting is that power dynamic. You know, for us, a lot of why we've been able to become comfortable with these things is because we learned how to do it in a space that was accepting and told us straight off the bat, like, hey, you know, power dynamics don't exist here. Like we're all just on the same level because without like the root of our youth space, I would not be in this room. I would be freaking out right now. I would not be able to deal with all of these adults because they teach us to be scared of you guys. They honestly do. They teach us, okay, this is an adult. You respect them. You say, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You do what you're told right? Like it's not, it's not something we're taught to do. So it's not something we can expect students to feel comfortable doing. And, you know, that might be a part of why it's difficult for you guys to get students to engage, to be honest, because this is a very intimidating space and we are taught further to be intimidated by you guys. So, you know, it's hard. It's, I rarely have met people with, you know, the courage to stand up to an adult in our current classroom setting. It's students get punished for it. Oh yeah, Moose, do you want to speak on that real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Not sure who that is. Is that Michelle? Uh, yes, that's me. Okay. Um, I have a comment um, for Mary. Um, like a living testament, testament, I am a graduate of the North Shore School District. And um, me and a friend, while we were in high school and junior high, every month for Black History Month, we would ask our teachers if we could use a whole class period to talk about Black History Month. And there wasn't really a structure. We had a presentation and then we went into a conversation. And we started talking about things like, what does it mean to say the N-word? What do people feel like about that? Um, and culture diversity. And we led a conversation, but we opened it up to students. And what we realized is from junior high to high school, the younger you start these conversations, the easier it is to have. And there was teachers who didn't make time for it. So we couldn't go into those classrooms. But the ones that did, we had the conversation. So even as complicated as it may sound, but we need to create the space because if a student can lead that conversation and break the space, I think that a teacher in that position of power or a board like this can create those spaces. Um, and then I had a comment on, I've been sitting back, I'm a par partner programmer with um, The Root of Us. Um, and I wanna say that these students have really shown out and I'm proud of you. Um, one of the things that you, you guys said was um, the workload. And I know growing, growing up in the system, I really wish there was a teacher, teachers would experience um, being a student for a day to humble themselves and realize um, how much workload and how much energy, just like once a year being a student for a day and having the workload and having to go, wear like a backpack. And I feel like that would be a humbling experience to kind of generate. Um, and yes, I think that that is. Thank you, Michelle. Can I ask a question? Okay. Um, so one, one's a comment and then there's a question. The comment is, I've been reflecting the statement that the, the work that you're doing in Root of Your Youth is very meaningful, but it's, it's such a great example of project-based learning. Um, and, you know, you, obviously you've learned a lot about public speaking and analysis and it just really shines through. Um, and it's, it's consistent with my own experience and doing things that are outside of school. And I think the, the state board is very much with you in terms of project-based learning, in terms of mastery-based and shifting the paradigm. And Paul Petrie is um, 
working hard on that as our representative on the mastery based work group. Um, my, my question has to do with the pathways. And I, it was somebody, I think it might have been Molly, who talked about flexibility. And I wondered if you can comment about this whole notion of whether pathways should allow exploratory courses, um, allow to what extent, um, especially in the CTE world, um, allow, allow shifting as students think more and, and gain more um, experience and so forth. Do you, do you have any thoughts on um, how the state board might try to um, reconstruct the whole pathways program in a way that's more student-centered and more student-friendly? For sure, that's a really good question because like it is a very large thing like it's easy to talk about like oh let's let's have everyone have individual graduation pathways, but then actually like sitting down and like planning it out is a very different thing that requires much different resources. Um, due to the fact that I do not have experience in creating curriculum like for public education, I don't think I can fully answer but I think I can give you my best idea of what I imagine high school looking like were it to have been more palated to the student experience. So um, by the time that I hit junior year of high school, I started doing Running Start and I would have done all of my classes in Running Start were it not that I was being forced to take an Alge 2 Trig class that has not benefited me and will not in the career that I'm going into in the college I'm going to this fall. And due to that class, it caused me to have such an overload taking a full three class course load at the community college I was attending. And also having this um, class with a teacher who saw me as a bumbling fool who did not know what to do. Um, with those combined, it caused me to drop classes. It made my mental illness worse because I personally do have ADHD and mental conditions aside from that that do affect my learning. So because of this being unaided and then also having such a heavy course load because I was being forced to take this class that I do not need, it literally made my life worse. And that's just like one very small example of how like were a graduation path more flexible, I could have opted out of that class and taken a different one to fulfill that credit on my diploma. Um, so there are technically opportunities for this. Like if you wanna take science and you wanna get a science credit, you don't technically have to take physics or chemistry. Um, you could take like a semester of marine biology, but due to the types of diplomas we have and due to the schedule students have, it's not as flexible as it fronts as. So I think the first step would to really be loosening the chokehold that there is on challenge and AP students and allowing them to get um, more AP credits. So let's say you wanna take a full AP course. Okay, allow them to attend an AP class for not just the one AP elective. And even just that would make it so much more like cultivated to the student experience. If you could even just take one more class that you actually cared about rather than one that is unnecessary strictly for it to be on your diploma. And I do understand that sometimes those are due to, um, you know, expectations that colleges have when students apply. Like that's part of the reason a lot of people do AP. But the other end of that is that also public education can afford to supply other AP classes besides STEM and besides one class period of AP history. So everybody and their mother who takes AP is gonna have this one class. So if you wanted to do band, screw you because it happens to be this exact period and you can't do it. So I think that would be the first step would to be loosening scheduling around AP classes, around challenge classes, around IB students, all of those different categories. That would be like probably my first step. I know you asked a broader question than I answered, but I, I'm 18. I don't know how to. I don't know how to create graduation pathways for hundreds of thousands of students. So I don't. I don't want to like take on things too big for my riches. And yeah, I hope that helps. Um, I want to add on to the question. I think Molly, you're amazing, and you know, said all the right things. And I think, like, while we are not, you know, fully educated on how the whole process of making and creating curriculum looks like. 
one thing I have to say is, so I um, am a Running Start student and I go to Cascadia College. One thing I've noticed is that the requirements for getting an AA are much broader than they are at school. So in high school, they're like, okay, well, you have to take this specific English class, this specific math class and this specific science class. And that's like it. Um, and so, you know, when you enter high school, you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick my classes, but it's an illusion. That's what it is. And, <laughs> you know, like in the end you're left just like, oh, I've done nothing I care about in high school. But when I got into, Cas you know, when I started at Cascadia, the requirements there are much broader in that, like, for example, if you have to do like a math class, if you don't like math, you can do this thing called philosophical reasoning, which is really cool. Um, and instead of just having like an English requirement, there's, you know, like, like humanities and there's a social sciences, like it's very broad and, you know, students can look at themselves and say, well, okay, there's this huge broad topic. And what am I interested in? Like what subtopics, what subset of this concept am I interested in? So instead of just taking a normal biology class, I took an evolutionary biology class. And instead of taking a normal drama class, if someone doesn't want to get up on stage and act, they could do film appreciation or something other than that. So I think loosening requirements and opening up horizons, because I think the, the like little box that we're all put in in high school stifles us. When you're forced to take classes you don't care for, you know, you don't have the passion for, your, your, your passion for, for learning dies. I loved school and I'm, I don't think I could really say that anymore. And it breaks my heart because I love reading and writing and learning new things. It's so cool. We have so many things on this planet that we can learn about. And, you know, while many may like think of like, oh, students, they're lazy. They don't wanna learn anything. They just wanna be on their phones and go on TikTok. No, it's, it's not that. We love learning. And even on TikTok, most of the content that we all see happens to be learning about the world, politics, art, music, anything. So loosen up a little, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I have to say. Okay. Our, um, I want to respect everybody's time, and we've gone uh, five something, 15 or so. Um, we don't have a hard stop, but um, are there other board questions or are there other things that the root of our youth um, guests wish to say? Let me ask first for other board questions or staff questions for that matter. Don't see anybody in chat. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill, Bill Kalapa. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks, Peter. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I just want to thank uh, this panel of students for coming uh, before us and allowing us to learn from them. And I want to ask them, um, I want to challenge them to continue uh, the type of leadership that they've exhibited today. Um, and that's because, uh, as we all know, as adults, there's, there's certain things that we can do policy-wise um, individually. Uh, collectively, we're much stronger, obviously. Um, but I'll give you an example of, of, of my life experience working with tribal youth. So as an advocate for tribal youth, I can go in front of tribal council and say, here's what our kids need. They need more books, or they need more literature, or they need internet access, or they need tickets to the Seattle Sounders game, or they need tickets to the Seattle Storm game to, to build a, a uh, role models, female role models, male role models, et cetera. We need more exposure to higher education. So I can advocate for tribal youth as an adult individual. And then tribal council can say, yeah, we agree with you maybe, or maybe we don't. But when students advocate, right? And so what I try to do is get um, our students in a group. Uh, it's called youth council with elected officials. Now you have youth students that go in front of tribal council and they request things for themselves that they need, it's really hard and it's really difficult for tribal council to ignore that request because it's coming directly from the youth themselves. So that's the power that you students hold. And when you come in front of us like you've done today and you express what you need from us as your leaders that represent you, um, it's really, really hard for us to ignore your words and the content behind it. Um, it, it and we've seen that happen 
I've seen that happen on the state board time and time again. So I just want to thank you uh, for coming today and allowing us to learn from you. Uh, but more importantly, I want to challenge you to keep up your leadership efforts uh, on behalf of yourselves and, and the student, your peer group, because, you know, it's so important for us to hear from you. It's so important for us to learn from you. And it's really, really hard for us to say no to you <laughs> when you're making such a request. So thank you again. Quick response uh, to you, Bill. I would like to counter challenge all of you to make an effort to listen to more student voice because we've been here, we've been speaking, we've been putting out content for a long time. Actually, it's been over a year now. And, you know, we're so lucky to have this opportunity, but there are so many other groups of students who are organizing, who are putting their voice out there, who are not as lucky as to have all of these connections. So I challenge you all to reach out, to find them, to involve students in whatever new way you can find. Because again, your entire job, as Bill said, is about the students, you guys represent us. So if you are not, you know, at the risk of sounding a little harsh, if you're not seeking out student voice, you're not doing your job anyway. And also with that, um, I'd like to drop a little link in the chat for you all. Um, with Vincent's company, Equity Institute, we do a bi-monthly little conference thing called Teach-Ins, where it's a whole like collective learning webinar. We learn from each other. And um, I invite all of you to join that because a lot of us are speakers there and you can see a lot more members of our group and be involved with us um, as you so choose. And I see that Vincent has his hand up. Would you like to say something, Vincent Perez? Thank you so much. I want to capture an idea that Fia Endicott, one of our, our members, uh, the root of our youth, mentioned in terms of flexibility. She's a native Hawaiian, and she's like, "What? I want to learn my language. So can the school support me in a virtual format where I just go to the library as part of my learning day and I can learn my language? So they're also talking about a hybrid model, right? We've been in virtual learning now for, for COVID and the possibilities have opened things up. And so can schools support that kind of individualized uh, pursuits of her, of her own native tongue? Interesting idea. Um, so Pavan, and Kankata Krishnan. No, uh, yeah, you're gonna, you're kind of close enough. Uh, so what I will tell you all is I'm uh, one of the, I, I'm the Western Washington representative. So if you're a student in, in Western Washington, I'm technically your student representative. So I will tell you, I listened to everything you all had to say uh, and uh, just keep in mind you all been heard. Uh, and I'm, you know, considering what you've, uh, put forward because um, one of the things that I like about the state is I'm originally from uh, Kentucky. Kentucky does not have this sophisticated level of like student representatives um, on the committee or, or on the state board of education itself. So we've kind of constructed, or at least what I see in the state, is a much more robust way to, you know, get student input uh, and you know listening to you and uh, making sure that. Um, your opinions are reflected in our policy as a demonstration of the fact that um, those routes are working and, and what we have worked. So uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for doing this. Um, and I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate it hearing from kids my own age uh, about what they uh, see in the system. Yeah. Thank you, Pavan. Sorry, I didn't get your last name. I'm, I'm word um, spoken challenged. Um, so Randy, do you want to wrap up and talk about where we go from here? Unless there's, but let me first give any um, root of our youth folks have one more thing say, Michelle, you want to say one more thing? Yes, I have one last comment. Since I'm we're sorry, already throwing out, oh, can you hear me? Better. Okay. Um, since we're throwing out challenges, um, I would like to challenge the board to make um, advanced programs like International Baccalaureate and AP more accessible, tr like transportation wise. As a graduate of International Baccalaureate program at Inglemore High School, I, trans I um, lived out of the district, but oftentimes had to go through three or four buses just to make it to school. Um, and my mission was to graduate IB. So 
a deficit that is not often highlighted is the gentrification and segregation between schooling and the available resources of which schools with advanced placements and who can actually attend. So like my challenge is to actually have enough access for students who desire to seek those programs to get there efficiently through transportation and not just ride shares. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, Randy, do you wish to say something? Uh, well, I just want to thank the students. They, they've, they've heard from me a bunch because I've been listening to them uh, every Wednesday for the last couple months. And it's been absolute joy, best part of my day, best part of my week each time I get to do that. So, uh, and you can see why. <laughs> so these students are amazing and uh, I think it really brought some good ideas to the table. They're also going to be providing us with some or actually have provided us with a draft and staff are going through that now of some written materials to support uh, their their comments to you as well. So we'll be sharing that um, as uh, uh, as a follow up to this as well. So I think just a big thank you and uh, thanks to everyone for hanging on past our allotted time as well. So appreciate that. Real quick before we sign off, just in case you have not been following the chat, our podcast is in the chat, our mental health op-ed is in the chat, pretty sure website's already in the chat, and so is the teach-in, which is a bi-monthly seminar thing that we do. So interested in any of those things, please, please go check them out if you want to hear more from us. Cool.